growing up as an evangelical Christian, (laughs) there were certain scripts and expectations that surrounded my life. I was taught that I was called and loved by God in an intimate, strange, and wonderful way. And that love meets us all in the darkness and brokenness and fuckery of life. And it tells us that we matter and it gives us hope. And as a result, that love is supposed to be transformative. You're supposed to make that internal love visible on the outside. Your life, as people would often say, should bear fruit of Christ's love and his impact on you. Which is a weird expectation to put on a love relationship and also a particularly awkward agricultural analogy to place on a kid from Los Angeles who was never expected to raise his own food. (laughs) Jesus, who is fond of many a convoluted parable, specifically tells his his followers in the book of Matthew that they will be known by the fruit they produce. And continuing this tortured plant and garden center metaphor, the big JC then adds that every tree that does not bear good fruit is to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Yikes. That's no pressure. Okay. So I grew up surrounded by the kind kind of loving people who are motivated by this. And I could see that kind of fruit in their lives. They volunteered in soup kitchens, They helped homeless people. They gave endlessly of their time and their energy for others. And they cared for a pudgy brown kid with a crooked smile and a sometimes violent, usually absent dad, a kid who just wanted to feel loved. Now, these were the obvious fruits of a well-tilled soil. These people demonstrated the kind of love that could have meaning. Now, the problem, of course, lay behind the second half of Jesus' little horticultural conversation. If you weren't producing good fruit, you were headed straight for kindling. And the ambiguity of good versus bad fruit was already worrisome. While it's easy to feel motivated by that kind of love, by that kind of meaning, it's easier still to feel anxious as fuck about whether or not your life is really showing the transformative power of love. So I spent so much time as an anxious teenager trying to love others, but I was also afraid that I wasn't good enough. I kept wondering if instead of being a productive orchard, I was destined to be a bundle of sticks used to fuel a fire. I didn't know yet that there was already a word for me, one that described a bundle of sticks. I'd hear it for the first time as a whispered accusation at a church camp as a teenager. And as I grew up in the church, it slowly dawned on me that I wasn't attracted just to women. Cool. There's a terrifying realization in that, though. The moment when you figure out that your body is out of sync with what everyone else takes for granted. The constant talk of marriage or families of a certain kind left a veil of silence around any other possibility. I was already aware in the unspoken gaps in sentences, in the adverted gazes, in the many blank spaces of everyday life, of what was acceptable and what was a weedy infestation destined for destruction. I learned that you could be charming and charismatic and very, very, very busy instead of a disappointment. Why worry about the feelings that lurk underneath the surface when you're busy doing so many kinds of ministry? I could lead a Bible study, or go to a prayer group, or take food to the elderly, or work on a building repair project. I couldn't be perfect, but I could be indispensable. I could be a different kind of valuable, and maybe, maybe that would cushion the blow if people found out that I wasn't good enough. So I spent high school and a terrifying amount of college trying to make my life produce something meaningful, visible, that would account for the uncertainty I felt lurching inside me every day. Which makes it absolutely perfect that the first person I ever kissed was entirely in the context of a Christ-related (laughs) check-in. So I'd known Kenji for a few years at college, and we both attended the same evangelical Christian group. Awkward shout out to you, Campus Crusade for Christ. You are the worst. (laughs) 
Thank you. Yay. So Kenji's parents were Asian immigrants, and his father was a particularly strict fundamentalist pastor. Now, and I'd noticed him chafe under the restrictive rules of his upbringing, and we talked after Bible studies or prayer meetings, again, Campus Crusade for Christ, about how he always felt compelled to be a dutiful son and conform to expectations, but he never felt like he fully could. There's something in my body that just won't let me, he said cryptically <laughs> once we met after coffee once. And I didn't know exactly what he meant, but I had a few guesses. So one night, Kenji texted me saying he was anxious and stressed and was wondering if I'd go for a walk with him along the beach and maybe we could talk and pray about things. Sure, I said. <laughs> cool. So the July evening was edged with that strange chill that comes off the ocean in the summer. And I nodded silently to Kenji as he talked at length about his fears and his hopes and his frustrations. We sat down on a bench. We watched the waves dip and weave, glittering in the moonlight like so many distant, unreachable jewels. And I heard Kenji's voice catch as he talked about how conflicted he felt with the life that was laid out, already planned before him. And I turned to look deep in his brown eyes, liquid with unspent tears. And I leaned in, placed my hand gently on the side of his face, and I kissed him. And he didn't start, and he didn't flinch. He leaned in, and he kept the kiss going. It felt as easy as singing along with your friend to your favorite song on the radio. And we held that kiss for a long time, my hand softly stroking his face, the waves softly crashing in and out, the occasional cry of a gull surrounding us in the ocean twilight. And when we broke apart, his eyes shimmered with tears. Fuck, we both said at the same time. <laughs> so this was not supposed to happen. This was not the way that bodies were supposed to go. These were not the harvests that we were supposed to reap. The fruits were too literal. <laughs> So I remember in that moment, though, this searing feeling of self-loathing in the core of my being. I wasn't supposed to want this. The fruits were monstrous. They were misshapen. They were wrong. And something was wildly awry in the neatly ordered rows of my life's orchard. And I looked at Kenji in panic and horror and confusion. And his face mirrored my own. And we immediately kissed again. <laughs> amid the wind and the waves. And I felt errant vines twisting in my heart, promising fruits I hadn't really fully wanted to consider before, but ones that were still worth savoring nonetheless. So it took me a while to fully open up to that possibility that was blooming inside me. I wasn't in a full state of denial, but I knew I was turning away from something that I could be. And I kept pruning branches that wanted to grow in directions that I knew that I could thrive in. So seven years later, I know, seven years later, I finally grew up on being, I gave up on being acceptable when I met Dan in graduate school in Illinois. So Dan was an extraordinarily painfully earnest person with slightly too large for him emo frames and wavy brown hair that never fully obeyed his Combs commands. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of Nirvana and early 90s grunge that he'd listened to in a rebellious phase growing up in rural Utah with his large Mormon family. I swear to God, there was so much sound garden in that relationship. <laughs> so much. He had this crooked half smile that would slowly creep up the side of his face in a way that made you feel like you were sharing this amazing secret, one for the two of you, just by yourselves. And he was warm and friendly and a little uncertain of himself, hoping that he could find a space where people could see and love him for who he actually was. And I recognized in some of his halting sentences and shy smiles, another person who had been told that their harvests were unacceptable. And we were each other's first male partners and it was scary and wonderful and confusing to learn that we could be lovable and have meaning, even if it didn't look like we planned. <laughs> 
So Dan had very happily left the LDS church a few months before we met, and he was working through his own complicated relationship to faith and spirituality. But unlike him, I didn't want to give up the faith community I'd been raised in. And if I'm honest, I didn't want to give up the promise of love that lay beyond an implicit threat of firewood. And the idea of being so singularly loved and cared for that a love like that could change you, make your body reorient itself in new ways, twist into blooms where barren stalks had been, that was the image that still tugged at my heart. And so, ill-advisedly, I would still visit my childhood church on vacations and visits home from graduate school. I would stand in those worship services with painfully genuine people, eyes closed, following the slightly <laughs> passive aggressive commands of a goateed guitarist chiding us to feel God's love. And you know, come on church. And I noticed something. At this point, I was living openly as a queer person. And though I spoke candidly about Dan as a part of my everyday life, I felt an immediate disconnect with any of the people that I'd known closely at this church. It reminded me why I'd been so exhausting being silent about it in the first place. People never outright said anything negative about Dan or me being queer, but they also pretended that this relationship did not exist. And at no point in the years that Dan and I dated, and it was almost four, did people ask about him. But church folks would tell me all about their wives and their husbands and their ever-growing brood of children. And I was always expected to listen and offer thoughts and affirmation. Once, when grabbing coffee with Paul, a former high school mentor, a guy I really looked up to when I was younger, I felt like, discussing, I felt like I was discussing a shameful secret when talking about buying my boyfriend a Christmas gift. Paul immediately redirected the conversation to talk about how gift buying was hard in general. Okay, Paul. <laughs> and then talked about his wife. And for him and so many other people I knew, it was like Dan was a pimple on my face that couldn't be acknowledged in polite company. I was like, oh, I'll just. <laughs> and after these church services, I always felt worse. You know, that heavy feeling like after you've wolfed down a particularly unsatisfying meal. You're just, ugh. And it took years to really grasp that so many people in the church I grew up in only loved me for parts of who I was. There was no big blow up to end it all. Rather, it was a slow burn that smoldered over the years, smoke curling in tendrils under the weight of all that neglect. Ironically, the final catalyst came from a moment of kindness that made me realize what exactly I was missing. One holiday weekend, I was stopped by Claire, the pastor's wife, after service. Now, Claire had crystal blue eyes, graying, sandy blonde hair in a short cut, and she really loved like loose, casual clothing, like peak tunic, right? <laughs> and I remember seeing this striped tunic as she walked up to me, put her hand in mine, and asked three matter-of-fact questions in quick succession. TJ. How's the last year of grad school going? Do you have a defense date for your dissertation? How's Dan? Are the two of you doing okay? I had been dating my boyfriend for two and a half years at that point, and everybody at that church knew. I had told them repeatedly, and no one, not one fucking person had ever asked me about him. Dan was not real to them. And as a result, his lack of existence made me not real, something to be ignored. And Claire, tunic and all, did not follow this unspoken rule. She saw me and she asked about all of me. And it was only afterward that I realized it was the first time anybody at that church had ever done so. And I cried on the car ride home, and I wasn't entirely sure why. Something was dying in me, and it wasn't enough to be afraid of firewood, of being bad branches, of not being enough. I had seen someone actually do the simple thing of seeing me and of loving me 
And this simple act made me realize just how much of it had been missing and how much of it I had been asked to give up. And so I stopped forcing myself to visit on holidays. And when I moved back to California a few years later, I didn't reach out. I was letting something else bloom within me and I was done living on other people's terms. Thank you. <laughs> a year ago, oh, we're not done babies. Mm. A year ago, my cousin, who still not only attends this church, worked on staff for years, and it is awkward, got married, right? And I love my cousin. And of course, I was gonna make it to her day, even though so many of the church people I'd known over the years would be in attendance. I felt a lump in my throat as I drove to the ceremony, which mercifully was not on church property. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I thought of all the times I'd looked in the mirror and whispered hateful things to myself. All the times I'd promised I'd be better or good or worth loving by not being who I was. I thought of all the times I looked at this glamorous, badass fruit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And instead saw a bundle of sticks. As I sat nervously in the parking lot, I saw my own face reflected in the rearview mirror. And I looked strong, and I looked beautiful, and I looked lovable. I thought about for how long I'd accepted piecemeal love as my due, as the rent I paid in exchange for feeling cared for. And I'd swallowed so much self-loathing and shame to feel worthy of belonging. I got out of the car and straightened my tie the one I'd chosen to wear specifically for the occasion. On it was a vibrant array of flowers blooming as they saw fit. Thank you. TJ Talley, ladies and gentlemen, TJ.